Hello, everyone. Welcome to Adventures Through the Mind. I am your host, as usual, James W. Gesso. Very opportunistically, I just got something in my eye. It's very distracting. Oh, God. Oh, cut. Alright, and we're back. Uh, so I want to start this episode with a couple of quick announcements. Um, the first of which is that I just got back from England, actually, which is very exciting, where I went to uh, give a talk, um, sort of like an entry-level talk to a group of people who aren't, you know, already included in our sort of psychedelic club, um, the in the no group, and so far as uh, the possibilities of psychedelics in the world. And I gave a talk basically um, outlining the role that they can play inside of... Um, inside of a society being faced with ecological crisis, um, very science heavy. Uh, and yeah, it went really well. Um, if you're a patron, you're going to get a chance to listen to that talk because I did record it. Um, and uh, I will also include the slides for you to check out as well. And so I'm excited about having come back from that. I'm also acknowledging that um, at this time, I'm feeling uh, I'm feeling sort of overwhelmed with uh, especially the season right now being uh, deep in the winter and having just gone through Christmas holidays working the whole way through and and uh, I'm gonna take a little break I'm gonna take a two episode break from the podcast which means uh, we'll be coming back March first um, and uh, I'm feeling good about investing that time into a secret project uh, that um, my patrons will know about. You, If you check your recent patron messages, uh, you'll see a video there um, of me explaining what this secret project is all about. And also to catch up on a few other side projects that I've really wanted to put out, um, but just have not been able to put the time into just because of, the, um, of my otherwise workload. Um, so I'm going to be taking a two episode break, but I will still be releasing some things. I got a couple cool videos coming out for the YouTube over the time uh, that I am not producing the podcast for these two episodes. I will be uh, basically preparing um, preparing these videos as well as doing uh, actually recording interviews for the upcoming time. So there will not be uh, there will not be any fruiting bodies for the month uh, for the next two episodes, but there the mycelium continues to grow and thrive. So uh, thanks so much for continuing to stay tuned in even after this short little break. That's basically the only announcement. So let's get into this episode. Today we feature Darren Springer on the show. Darren Springer is a grassroots researcher and event organizer based in London the director of Ancient Future, the conveyor of the Psychedelia Railway Gatherings, and curator at Earth Tone Arts. Collectively, his work aims to inform and empower individuals from diverse backgrounds to cope with social challenges and contribute to community development, as well as self-improvement in an innovative, creative, culturally aware style. By day, Darren teaches organic horticulture and food enterprise to young people in London and grows edible mushrooms. He has spoken in the UK, Africa, Europe, and the US, sharing his extensive research on African entheogenic plants and their various applications on the continent and the diaspora. And he is on the show with us for this episode uh, to go pretty deep into the pan-African use of mushrooms, actually, and the um, origins of mushrooms. It's sort of like ancient and future at the same time, because we talk about the ancient past, and then we get into sort of like, where are we right now? Um, oh, by, I, I say we, but it's really more about him and, and his community, the black community in England, um, where I'm I'm not included because I'm a, I'm a white guy from North America. Uh, but 
we talk about the past and we talk about how the past is showing up in the future, in the present, and how we might be able to step into the future. I know that's all very cryptic, but you'll get a sense of it once the interview starts. A couple points about this interview. It is on location. It was shot back in August um, of 2018, no longer this year. And uh, it was on location. Darren shares the location right at the beginning, so you get a sense of uh, the sort of environmental context in which the conversation happens, which is outside. So there's some wind periodically. There's an airplane twice, I think, uh, and you'll hear some chirping animals um, in and around as well because it's right in the thick of it. You know, it's like right smack dab in the middle of reality, not isolated in these little, uh, you know, sound treated, sound treated boxes uh, that they that they take place in. And uh, yeah, that's actually the only point. Oh, yes. And the uh, video feed drops off. If you're watching it on YouTube, it drops off uh, about uh, about 45 minutes in out of an hour. So I mean, most of the video feed is present. Um, but I've replaced it with a very happy photo of Darren and I. So you will be able to still take in our vibrant faces, um, even though the video feed is dropped. And of course, this episode has been brought to you by Patreon. <laughs> well, not the company, but uh, the capacity for people to fund and support this show through that company's platform. Um, so huge thank you to my patrons who make this podcast possible and, and make it even possible for me to take the two episode break I'm about to take to invest in a, in a greater richness of content and the secret project that only patrons will know about. Uh, so huge thanks to to my patrons on Patreon, especially the people whose names are listed on the screen here on YouTube or uh, listed in the description to this episode um, on whatever podcatcher you listen to it or jameswbjesso.com where all these podcasts are posted. Um, and I would also like to give a big shout out to uh, Hassan who just donated quite a significant amount of money to get a transcript made of the last episode, um, the one with the psychedelic therapist, which is now up on jameswbjesso.com as well if you'd like to check that out. If you would like to become a patron of the show, you can do so by heading to jameswgesso.com forward slash support, where you find options for Patreon, PayPal, Bitcoin, uh, merchandise such as t-shirts. Um, I'm not wearing the t-shirt right now, but I'm showing off the one that I am wearing on, on video um, or, you know, art, etc. So if you're liking the show and you'd like to support it by putting some cool swag on your body or just by throwing some money into the pot, you can do so by heading to James wjesso.com forward slash support and i thank you very much for doing so that's it for the intro please enjoy this episode with darren springer on adventures through the mind all right darren all right, james <laughs> get comfortable oh uh, yeah why don't you uh start us off by letting us know where we are right now Okay, so we are in London, East London in particular, in the London Borough of Waltham Forest. And the location we are in is called Organically, which is basically a food growing project in the local area, which provides local residents up to about 500 a week with organic, healthy food. And we do a range of different things here on the site, everything from training up young people, people who are suffering from health or mental challenges, and help you, in, you know, engage and develop their you know, um, therapeutic um, benefits through engaging in nature and food growing, man. So that's what we do here. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the specific area that we're in is called the the magic. Oh, the magical realm. The magical yeah, realm. The magical realm. Yeah. Perfect place to be. Yeah, yeah great. Yeah. So uh, we're just sitting down. Sure. We've been chatting for the last couple of days. Lots of conversations in the car. Sure. We're just sitting down now. We're in this beautiful place. Everything's recording. We're taking a minute. We're landing, mm -hmm. and there's a curiosity that I've got. Obviously the curiosity is who are you and what are you doing? Now I already have that here, but we don't have it here yet. Sure. So one of the sort of basic themes, if we were to say like, okay, Darren Springer, mm -hmm. who is this guy? What is, you know, what is the niche, niche things you could point at and be like, oh yeah, that guy, the mushroom guy. <laughs> yeah. Right. But particularly, you've got this heavy focus on the Pan-African use of mushrooms, um, which is something that's not really talked about or even really fully understood. Um, there's a lot about sort of like ancient African culture that isn't generally understood, and we could maybe make a case for the 
mentality and the ethnicity of the anthropologists sure. uh, in that sense. Well, why don't you just start us off by telling me something as like a foundation, uh, like a foundational myth or a foundational story uh, of the mushrooms inside of African culture. Okay, so um, I'll get there, but before getting there, sure. what I think is just how I got there. Yeah. Um, and that was based on, you know, me having a, you know, um, an interest in discovering this knowledge and information after having experiences myself. And um, like you said, based on the research that was currently available to me and I was checking out for myself, um, I personally felt that there was just gaps. Um, and I was always curious and interested to know, you know, the role that Africa as well as the Caribbean played in psychedelics, the usages of them and so forth. And going to all these conferences, festivals and so forth, I was pretty much shown that there wasn't much available pretty much told there isn't anything available and what is available you know I was pretty much told you know you guys have got Ebola that's you know something that we know from Africa and that's great for heroin addiction and alcohol recovery and stuff like that and I was like that's cool but it just didn't sit well with my spirit um, for me those are all kind of like um, after the facts you know after you have this issue or problem you can use these plants to help for your recovery but um, my, my mentality and vibe was like you know do they have heroin in, in the Congo do they have mental asylums and prisons in, you know, where we're talking about it for a recovery, you know, perspective. Um, and it just inspired me to think that I think that they don't have these things there, these institutions, because it's, they use these plants in a way where it's a preventative measure. It prevents you from getting to the point where you are going to commit or murder somebody, so to speak, and would end up in prison or commit crimes or robberies amongst your own people and so forth. So it was much of the inspiration for me starting out this journey and doing the research. So my thinking was, you know, just I just went to a childlike mentality. Let me go, just like I asked my mum, you know, things like, you know, if Adam and Eve were the first people, like, I wonder how, if they knew how we got here, you know, where did they come from? And that's the kind of mentality that I took. I wonder if the earliest people use psychedelics and if they do <laughs> is there any record of them using psychedelics yeah. and that's how that's basically pretty much where my journey started so my research looked at let me find you know I'm not an anthropologist and I'm not a, you know a, I'm a grassroots researcher as I refer to myself I just you know do my own research but it was pretty obvious that you know the earliest people are being you know widely documented and you know um, this is your so-called pygmy people from the central Af you know central region of Africa you also find groups of them pretty much down in South Africa as well distinct two distinct groups but pretty much the oldest people we know humans that we know where they pretty much have no birth records even to the point where the first Europeans that encountered them didn't classify them as human beings. Right. They were, you know, actually like looked at, looked at them as some kind of advanced primate, you know, mm -hmm. um, the missing link, so to speak. Um, and um, what I found out, the amazing things I found out about these people um, in general, outside of psychedelic usage, um, led me on this journey basically into finding out, you know, let me find the earliest people see if they've got any records of using it and let's see you know what they say about it and how they used it and um that's where it basically took me back to this group of so-called pygmies i say so-called pygmies because the term pygmy is a derogatory term it's not how they refer to themselves mm -hmm. um, they're known by various names depending on their geographical location as well as the bloodline you know the blood that runs through their veins we did we determine what groups they're associated with but they're primarily known as like the twa the Akka, the Baka, the Mbuti and the Babongo tribes. And you find them all around Central Africa. Then you've also got a group in South Africa. They've coined them as the Khoisan people, but they're actually the Khoi people, Khoi Khoi people and the San people. They're commonly also called the Bushmen of South Africa. Um, as I said, these guys have got no birth record. When you actually ask them, if you've got the type of people, if these researchers took the time out to go and ask them, which, which some have have, so I won't take, take nothing away from some of them, um, ask them where they come from and where their beginnings are, they talk about their beginnings being unearthly. Mm. Like they talk about their origins not being from Earth and so forth. And um, yeah, so it was just an interesting journey that I started, you know, in exploring these groups and, you know, their legacy. But what I came across was some of their um, creation stories. So that's what I said, let me go back to the earliest people and let's see what they say, where we all came from. <laughs> and obviously, as you know, just like in most religious traditions, you know, there's various creation stories or interpretations of the creation stories. But one that I came across, which was reported by somebody called W.F. Bonin in 1979, I believe, he, you know, he was traveling there. And they basically spoke about um, this mushroom called a long cock. That was the name of the mushroom. It was called a long cock. It was an entity. And they say that, you know, prior to um, creation existed just this mushroom, which they corresponded with an egg or it had the shape of an egg. Mm. And they say that the, um, this mushroom basically split in half. 
something caused the mushroom to split in half. The top half of the mushroom became the skies and the heavens, and the lower part became the earth. And then all things came out from, from this mushroom. They say the stars, mountains, rivers, also the Great Mother called the long cock. And I say that because what I found in this research, you know, looking at these indigenous groups in Africa, there was a synchronicity between mushrooms, the Great Mother and heaven. In some cultures, they actually have the same name and have the same, you know, root words, basically. Um, and that was like a catalyst for me to say, well, look, one, we've got some of the oldest people on planet Earth, as we know today, with the earliest creation stories. And their first reference that I could relate to was a mushroom. Right. And they're saying everything came out of a mushroom. And I always say to people, people are like, you know, I do workshops and I share this information as well. And they're pretty much like, do you believe that? You know, do you think do you think we really came from a mushroom? And I always explain that the mythology. Do you really think that uh, all of mankind or humankind came from two people? <laughs> exactly. So um, I always explain to people, you know, that what I've understood now is that uh, mythology, because I'm a bit of a mythology nerd, you know, um, and there's various types of mythology, various layers of mythology as well. But um, it's pretty much science, high level science, high end science that has been broken down or simplified and delivered in an oral story form. And if you understand the codes, the interpretations, you can understand that there's a lot of truth in what they've been teaching for millenniums now. And in my humble opinion, science is just catching up, you know, and maybe because these people lived in environments in nature, looked primitive, didn't seem like they were too smart based on the people who were visiting them. They didn't take their interpretations of how we got here seriously. But then going to study science and studying horticulture, then you find out things about soil and how soil came and you know the, the formation of the planet. You see the role that mushrooms or fungi or mycelium has played in that development. And you're like, yeah, these guys are onto something, you know? And it might not be scientifically on point as the science is trying to present it to us now, but nonetheless, the principles stay the same and they were aware of this. So I take nothing away from them and take heed to their creation stories and their beliefs as much as science is trying to present the stuff now. So that was the catalyst, man. That was the inspiration that made me say, I've got to look into this more. Cool. That's, how it all started, That's very yeah. interesting stuff. So, something else that you said there, and this is maybe tracking back, but I, I think it's an interesting point that you are either were making or I'm going to make in reference to what you okay. said, which is uh, talking about Iboga um, and saying that like, oh yeah, you know, African people have Iboga. That's Africa's entheogen. Like, as in like there's only six or seven plants in the world or something, right? Um, and that Iboga does this. It cures addiction. It, you know, blah, blah, blah. But this comes from this really, I think, um, narrow-minded uh, track of legitimization that focuses on the medicalization of psychedelics. Sure. Oh yeah, Africa has this value. That value is treating this Western disease, sure. um, which maybe I'm unfairly characterizing it. There are a lot of great people in the research, of course, mm -hmm. but then this idea that a psychedelic, its value and its place is defined by its medical application. But Iboga mm -hmm. doesn't have um, it, it has so much more than a medical application and in these in these cultures yeah it was it was a medicine but it was also it was like deeply spiritual it was a deep essential aspect of the whole culture um, so now I don't know if you want to speak to that so please do mm -hmm. but now I'm trying to formulate this question that's somewhere around you know what have you you've got this origin um, creation myth, which sounds almost pejorative by saying it, but I don't intend that, you know, creation myth, like it's imaginary. But what have you found for the various uses of mushrooms inside these cultures beyond a medical use? Okay. If any at all. Yeah, cool. Sure. So one thing I will say is the, well, Africa primarily is our oral tradition. Um, due to history, a lot of the information has been lost in translation. Um, and it's not, um, as straightforward or as clear to say this is you know this is what you know the usage of mushrooms has been in, in, in Africa and in all honesty I've not found it easy to find information in, in regards to how the mushrooms have been used in indigenous cultures I found some stuff out but I've been primarily directed to the women mm. in those communities who were the last to hold that knowledge and um, have grasped <laughs> and clutched at a few things that have helped support the idea that definitely mushrooms and other tools, plant power plants as we refer to them, have been used and not in just a medicinal way. Yes, they do have medicinal properties and values, but the origins or introduction of these plants of these communities wasn't based around that. So I can't speak on mushrooms at this point, but I can definitely share the story of Ebola because you mentioned about Ebola and, you know, as we said, it's been discussed about it great for heroin and alcohol recovery and, you know, addictions in general. 
but um, when you go to the mythology again, because that's pretty much where you know the, the, the information is held within the mythology, and they talk about how Iboga was gifted to, to, you know, gifted to the people. And um, the story goes as far as, um, in a nutshell, that there was um, a so-called pygmy, his name was Betamu, and um, he was in the trees, you know, collecting fruit. And um, God, or the creator, or the, you know, um, for some reason or another, made him fall from the tree, and he died. <laughs> and then God, the creator Zami is known as Z or Z, A M E. He um, cut off his little fingers and little toes of this uh, of Betamu and planted them in various parts of the forest. And um, from his little fingers and little toes grew the aboka plant or the aboka bush. And um, the story continues, and basically Betamu's wife goes in search of her husband. You know, he's gone missing. She's trying to find him, and basically can't find her husband. And she ends up being inspired to enter this cave. And as she goes into this cave, she hears a voice and the voice starts go, you know, who are you? What are you here for? You know, and so forth. And she pretty much says, look, come here. I'm looking for my husband, this, that and the other. And um, the voice tells her to like, look, to look at the end of the cave and there's, there's a bush growing. You know, there's a bush at the end of the cave. It says, go grab the bush and eat its roots. So she goes, gets the, you know, the bush and eats its roots. And then, she then the voice then tells her to turn around. And then she turns around as a pile of bones. But then from the bones, her husband and all of her dead relatives appear in that, in that space. And then the voice tells her that you've now been given the tool that will allow human beings to communicate with the dead and have their counsel. Mm. And that will enable you and what they, how they refer to it is, and it was the first recorded or you know, recorded baptism ceremony as far as being able to work with and communicate with the dead or the ancestral realms. So that was how and why Iboga was gifted to, to the people of that region in, in Gabon and the Congo and so forth. Oh yeah, cool. It's actually, I, I, had, I had heard a different creation story because I, um, or discovery, it's not creation story, but like uh, first Iboga encounters when I interviewed um, Elizabeth Bast and Chor Boogie, who are Iboga people. But the story has similar themes, which is something like the woman, the wife was the first person to have the Iboga. And you're mentioning here in these old, uh, in, in this, this old myth that it's like, you know, first was the, was the mushroom, which I, I, I mean, I don't know how much ancient people would understand about like hyphas and mycelium and, and all this stuff, but it appears to grow from no seed. It just comes up out of nowhere and it's a singular entity that just like spreads itself kind of thing. Um, so maybe it's like a, it's a great expression of like from non-duality or something, mm -hmm. right? Sure. Um, comes, because there's no pollination with mushrooms or whatever, right? Uh, comes first the female. Sure. Com comes first the female, which of course, from the female, all life comes. Uh, so my curiosity there is now looking at the role of the woman inside of these cultures as, as medicine holders. I, I previously um, interviewed uh, a man named Mudu while I was at Ozora. And he, his whole talk was about um, the role of women as the medicine carriers, uh, and not just for medicine in the healing sense, but also um, that they were, the, uh, they were the ones that were responsible for warfare as well, spiritual warfare. The men were great at bashing in heads with clubs, but if you needed to wreck an entire culture by like curses or, or poisonings or whatever it was, mm -hmm. that you would trust in the women because they were the carriers of the, of the herbal knowledge. What, do you, what have you discovered inside of, I mean, I'm gonna say Pan-African again, but it feels like such a, like, oh yeah, yeah, Africa, that one place. But what have you found insofar as the role of women as the medicine carriers inside of African so cultures? you've made me think about a few things, but first of all, most big up Moodoo, man. That's my yeah. brother in Detroit, you know, part of the family, the circuit. So I can only imagine that he gave you a wealth of good information. Yeah, man, I've seen that presentation myself, so yeah. Um, as far and then going back to Africa and this pocket Africa over there, what I would definitely want to bring to the forefront and what I share in all my presentation that I've been doing of recently while I go into the mythology is that this is a global story, it's a global history, mm -hmm. it's not just African, and that's what my research has shown me that if you follow the trail and follow the journey, that if that's African, everything that you're doing, everything she's doing, everything that they're doing, wherever they are, is African. Because right. when you follow the trail and go back to the root, we're all, as I tell people, there's one story, my man, there's one story being re retold over and over again with different characters, different names, but 
but the principles stay the same. So just like you said, you may have heard another Ebola story. It's Chinese whispers, man. You know, I'll tell you a story, I ask you to go and repeat the story over there. You're not going to say exactly how I say it. There's going to be slight variation. Then they go and tell somebody. Next thing you know, I started off with talking about Mary and you said her name's Mariam. Then he said it's Mary, then it's Margaret. And, you know, then I'm saying, no, I said, and that's how the story, you know, has, yeah. And then people say, well, that's over there. No, it's the same story. So to then answer your question as far as the role of women, that's how I found, that's how I discovered a lot of this information was through, again, I'm the mythology guy. So I looked at, okay, you go to, you know, the Congo, the first people, they talk about the, the wife, Atanga, because you always hear about the hero being, the, you know, the guy normally, but it's always, it's, it seems to be the wife and the mother. That's what I kept on coming across. And then in particular, as I said, on this journey, I kept on seeing the, the role of the great mother coming up and I'm into mythology so I know about the goddess, the great mother and the principles that they're all but that was core to the, you know to, to, to the mushroom mythology that I was going into and um, what it brought me to was you know um, the Congo and then I traveled into not, not physically but my research took me into ancient Egypt and I was looking at the goddesses from that you know from old traditions and seeing that there was a common thread that tied in you know the, the Atanga that's the what the wife in um, in the Congo mythology um, Isis better yet Oset in the Egyptian mythology then I can bring you to Babylonia or Mesopotamia and we can look at the goddess Ishtar and then I can take you into Europe into Greece and we can look at Persephone and you can see there's a story one story the same story that I can take take you back to the Congo and to see in principle it stays the same where the woman is the key figure in introducing the mushrooms to the community they were the holders of the mysteries um, I know you're familiar with people like Karl Ruck and all the rest of it talking about the Eleusian mystery all of that troll comes back and the women's were you know the gatekeepers from pretty much what I've you know from, from not even pretty much they were there's no two ways about it uh, I said if you look at the Egyptian one with Isis and it was all to do with the underworld so it also corresponds with the realm of the ancestors the realm you know of other dimensions the same story that they were talking about with Ebola and why it was introduced and you go into Egyptian mythology and Isis supports or is the hero that helps her husband resurrect who then becomes lord of the underworld and enables people to communicate with those realms and then the same story you take it into Babylon you've got Ishtar and then she spends a few days in the underworld. I don't know if you're familiar with it, the goddess Ishtar in Babylonian mythology and her role. Okay, same story. Then you go into Greece, Persephone. She gets captured by Hades, who's the god of the underworld who takes her under. And they all end up spending three days in the underworld. And then they die and they resurrect and come out the other end. Sounds like a story I've heard before growing up. The Easter story, uh, yeah. Yes, yeah. <laughs> that's where it comes from, Definitely. you know? So that's part one of the recent presentations that I've been given, just the whole Jesus mythos. And I'm sure you're familiar with, you know, John Allegro and his teachings, the sacred cross on a mushroom and Jesus being a mushroom. And again, I put that in my presentation, a lot of people laugh and think, I mean, you don't believe that, do you? It's like, you know, belief is a, you know, a word that I don't like to, you know. Well, it is, it is kind of a hard press. And given that basically every one of Allegro's colleagues disowned him after that, and he was basically saying something along the lines of, of like, the, Jesus is a mushroom, and the mushroom is the yeah. uh, fly argaric, um, sure. and that that it, all of Christianity is this sex cult, and that yeah. it's like cons like bathed in semen and blood and some other things. There's like yeah. so it's kind of it's kind of hard pressed, but yes, I, I I see there's like some great interesting sort of like um, going further back. There are these mm. almost like um, you get you start at the capillaries. And eventually you find your way back closer and closer to these bigger veins until you get to the heart. And like I tell you, just doing the research, it's very, it's challenging. It's challenging even coming across the information because, you know, it really starts delving into the, into the taboo, man. Areas that at one point I would feel uncomfortable delving into, you know, and the fact that this is what it's rooted in. And we've been given this kind of holier than thou approach to religion and spirituality and, you know, the rest of it to see like, is this what was going down, you know? And it's like, shit, man, like that's, you know, that's what I've come across. So, you know, the fact that, you know, we've given, been given this kind of Jesus archetype now, um, I mentioned John Allegro because, you know, he's, you know, he's famous. There's a famous interview that he's got on TV show and a guy says to him, you know, so you're trying to say Jesus is a mushroom? He's like, yeah. And he's like, well, what about Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the writers of the Bible? You know, you're trying to say they're not real, they didn't exist? He's like, no, they didn't. It's all mushroom mythology. It's all part of this secret society stuff. And I always share to people, like, when I heard that, and every time I watch it, I can't, I just, I'm laughing. I'm busting up in stitches, man, because yeah. I just find the interview hilarious. But at the same time, straight as soon as the first time I heard that, James, it was like, ping. I was like, hold on a minute, this guy's onto something. Because I'm fully aware that the Jesus story, the Jesus archetype, isn't an original story. You know, there's several 
archetypes, several mythologies that predate the Jesus story that talk about exactly the same thing. That's him dying, going away for three days and resurrecting. That's an Ishtar story that predates the Jesus story by thousands of years. So there's a Persephone story. So all these things are, you know, as I said, predate that, predate that story. Well, I'm, I'm pretty agnostic about all of that. I, I understand that, well, currently, I don't know if agnostic is the right thing, but, you know, I understand that I don't fully understand the nuances. I also mm. understand that it's not the way I've been told. And the more that I do learn, the greater reason there is to keep questioning. Definitely. Although it, it, I, I still feel like there's a good possibility that this Jesus guy was an actual person at some point, but mm. due to the role and like sort of the mixing of cultures, especially after, with the Roman conquest and the amount of uh, like mixing of cultures to sort of like sure. under this big umbrella of Christianity that he would start to receive attributions of ancient story but, and like the, the b but the level of questioning is extremely important yeah but that is it it's you're on the money because if you're into mythology anybody who's into mythology knows this stuff you don't it's not too far like because it's if it's myth it's not to be taken literally that's what I always tell people there's you know there's room for interpretation and there's room for perspectives but um, it's clear that his story is an original story and you can find the same stories all around the world. And then what you find is that when you get to this Jesus character, um, he's got the attributes of all of the guys. They made him to like the superhero. He's the, he's got all the archetypes, in, you know, within him. And it's like, so that's why where I'm coming from, from that premise. So I'm saying that to say that when the more you read some of the Jesus mythos, it's like, okay, you see that some of it's coming out of Babylonia, some of it's coming out of ancient India, some of it's coming out of ancient Africa, ancient Egypt in particular, you find um, the Horus figure. You familiar with um, Horus? Yeah, and you know, that's where we get the word, you know, the original word Horus is a Greek word. That's not the original, the word Horus is a Greek term. It's rooted in the word Heru, that's the ancient Egyptian term. And it's where we get the word hero from. And in ancient Egyptian mythology, he was the hero. And most people say they're not familiar. Again, in my presentations, I talk about, you know, who's familiar with the holy family of ancient Egypt, Isis, o Osiris, and Horus, better yet, Osor, Aset, and Heru. And uh, most people are not familiar with it, you know? And I normally do it by show of hands. Like, by show of hands, who knows, you know, the holy family in ancient Egypt, nobody puts their hands up. Then I put up the next slide, and normally the next slide is a slide from the Lion King Great. movie. And I'm like, who's familiar with this movie? Yeah, yeah, I'm right. familiar with this movie. I'm like, well, then you know the family, because again, it's one story being told over again. This is an ancient Egyptian mythology story. The mother, father and child being, you know, and the evil uncle, you know, who kills the father and the son has to come back and avenge his father's death. The same mythology yeah. coming out of ancient Egypt. So I'm saying that to say, going back to John Allegro, that I'm familiar that ancient Egypt is pretty much a mushroom cult. And knowing that the Christ figure in Christianity, Jesus, is basically a Photoshop copy and paste version of earlier mythologies that start sharing or giving more details and information about what that holy family or that figure was actually bringing to the table, you start kind of getting a better picture of the role that this Jesus character was. So I'm saying that to say that in ancient Egypt, Horus or Heru is the guardian of the mushroom world, of the underworld, Amenta, the hidden land. So when John Allegro is making those claims, for me, it doesn't sound too far off. I'm not saying to take it literally, like Jesus was a literal mushroom that came out of the ground. These are metaphors, you know, but there's, there's truth in what he's saying, if you understand the interpretation. But like he said, it's all secret society coded stuff. And I guess if you're not in those circles or not privy to that, or not willing to delve into those spaces, you wouldn't know, and it would sound really stupid and immature saying something like that. And well, to me, it just it just seems pretty extreme. It's like kind of a, an extreme an extreme thing to claim. But uh, I'm very interested. Uh, a couple, I think it was a couple of years back. Am, am I incorrect that you actually you went to the Congo? You went you went to Africa? I didn't go to the Congo, man. I'd love to, man. I was in the Gambia. I was in the Gambia when I went to here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, were you were you there um, related to this work? Like, were you on sort of like anthropological like <laughs> investigation? No matter where I go, I, I, I say to you earlier, and I carry my toolbox with me. Man. So whatever I'm invited there for, I pull out the toolbox and I start you know you know getting involved in other areas of two that of interest. So you know, I wasn't there for that, but yes, I was also there for that. Right, right. Um, not officially, I wasn't there for that, but you know. Um, but again, interestingly enough, James, I've, what I've come to find out is that, as I said, in Africa. It's um, oral, an oral tradition that's been lost fundamentally um, by a lot of the key, key players. And more importantly, um, it really is like John Allegro said, it's a secret society, secret society that starts in Africa, you know, and led to other places in the world where we've got fraternities now. So I'm saying that to say that I can't just turn up in Afri Africa, although I might be, have African descent and get the information. Right. It's not going to be accessible to me. I need to come from the family. I need to have, be part of the bloodline or I need to be initiated right. into those particular orders to get that knowledge and information. I can't just turn up and say, hey, guys, I'm doing a bit of research. Tell me all the knowledge and information. They're not going to give it to me. Like I'm going to have to live with them. I'm going to have to 
be part of that and show and prove that I'm worthy of earning that information. Mm. So the 14, 15 days that I spent there was not enough, man. So I'm very keen to, as I said, partly of while my last time and space in this space here, the magical realm and yeah. onto my new journey so that I can go places like that and spend a lot more time and not having to be restricted and having to be, you know, in this country for the time periods that I've had to be. So I'd like to go back and find out more, yes. And I did meet people that did have some key interesting information, but there's only so much they're going to share in so much time. Because they need to feel comfortable with me, what, you know, and, and so forth. I can't just turn up and say, tell me the mysteries. And yeah, well, I mean, that, that makes sense. I mean, there's a, there's, a, there's a pretty strong track record of that information being misused and misrepresented exactly. over the last thousands of years. Um, let's, let's, let's come to a little bit closer to the present moment. Um, in an earlier conversation that will not be ever public due to extremely poor sound quality, we talked a little bit about um, about the uh, like the communities that you're a part of here in London. You talked about how you grew up in an area that's pretty well gentrified at this point. East Hackney is, is that correct? Right? Well, yeah, but Newham, but Hackney, yeah, East London, man, pretty much East London. Right. Yeah. So, and, and, but that when you were growing up, it was a you, with the murder mile, the murder alley, yeah, yeah, they used yeah, to call it. It's a pretty alley, dangerous yeah, place, right? Yeah, yeah. And um, I mean, if I were to, if I were to think in my head, okay, like, what's my immediate stereotype of low-income black communities? Well, it's crime and it's drug use. Yeah. Mm. Um, now, I want that stereotype challenge as fully as it needs to be challenged when I ask you this question. But what have you seen in your journey working with psilocybin now? And and I know that you're like. Um, you're very, you're very uh, dedicated to like being a part of your community, bringing your community into the world that you're in, in the sense of like sharing this knowledge. What have you seen and, and what are you seeing as the possible role of a, of a reintroduction of, um, of looking at mushrooms as an, as an ancient um, technology or cultural, uh, cultural technology that is like relevant directly to people, um, basically, you know, black people uh in in the in, in the culture and community that you're in right now like i mean take that question however you need to but that's what my my curiosity is right now okay so first and foremost i would say in response that my entire community is in need of these tools and vices to support them that's people from all backgrounds because i think we're all in a sticky situation at the moment and we all have a role a role to play in in, in the healing and the transformation you know in coming out of that space um, but obviously being somebody by way of, I'm first generation born in the UK, you know, was, my, my mother came over here when she was 10 years old. Obviously we have a heritage that goes back to Africa, which I'm pretty much have been disconnected from outside of me making a conscious effort to reconnect with that. Um, we're now here in the UK, you know, few generations down the line, we're still in a position where in the Western world, we, you know, people of color, black people in particular, that I'm, obviously where my focus lies, are pretty much at the bottom of the ladder all the time, but of the social, you know, economic, educational ladder. And um, that sh not, shouldn't be the case, in my opinion, based on knowing all the contributions. If we can go back to the dawn of, of time and bring back and see what we've, you know, what we've brought to the table. Um, it should be respected, valued, and not to say we are any superior or anybody else is any superior, but we mentioned it earlier on, you know, if you have privileges, you know, there should, that should be distributed equally or evenly amongst, you know, amongst the community, who, wh wh whoever your community is, whatever your community is made but up by, of. Uh, by upping the privilege of the, di of the disprivilege, not that, by, you know, cutting privilege down yeah. necessarily. And not looking down, feeling sorry, feeling like I can help you, like, no, I'm going to help you to help yourself, you know, and we're all going to be on the same page, you know, we're all going to be you know, moving from the same, same standpoint. So um, with that said, obviously I have a focus with my community. That's, you know, you know that's where my basis lies. So um, there's multiple ways that I look at how the, these tools, these plants can be used um, in supporting and rehabilit rehabilitating my community. So yes, I am of the premise that things like Ebola can help with alcohol recovery and mental health issues. And I believe these plants will be and should be used for that because we have some of those issues in, you know, in our community, definitely. But um, like I said, I see, I, I see it more as a preventative measure. And I say that because what I have discovered about the, these plants and how they're used in Africa, they are pretty much tied in and locked into rites of passages mm -hmm. that from birth you are introduced to these plants and they are part and part of your lifestyle. It's a way of life. Mm -hmm. And um, I personally think, as you know, after having these experiences, that I've had my experiences that I'm thinking, wow, this has, you know, supported me in developing myself, you know, becoming, you know, a better version of myself, you know, so to speak, but at least um, opened me up to new horizons. And, um, 
you know, a lot of us are, you know, locked down in our, like I said, in our little bubbles, in our prisons, as I said, it's like an open prison kind of mentality that we have, that we think we're free, but we're not really free. So I'm saying that to say, when you go back, these plants were used as a rites of passage, you know, various plants, whether they were isolated or combined, and whether you was a young boy or girl from, from birth, as I said, in some cases, but primarily once you hit that puberty age, you were then introduced to these plants. You were introduced to your ancestors, your guides, you know, the people who can support you in your journey through adulthood. And like I said, I believe that the lack of these plants in our community and young boys, young girls becoming young men and young women have led to the world and the current climate that we have, where, as I was saying, in my community, there's a lack of love. There's a lack of, you know, um, um, respect. There's a lack of compassion and empathy, you know, because young people in particular in this current climate are quick to pick up a knife, a gun and stab and shoot somebody for next for pretty much no reason. Um, there's not the ability to communicate on a, on a base level, like how are you feeling, how are you doing? And that's not just in my community, that's, you come to London, as we were speaking earlier on, and you, you see like there's, the, you know, the, 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 there's, a, there's a real big gap that I feel that I've experienced that when I go to other places and communicate with other people that are from these cultures or from these traditions or have experienced these plants it's a whole never type of experience as you know I say that to say that I'm here now talking with you James you know as a black man talking to a white man and I come from a community a pan-african community which was staunch you know very focused on you know black initiatives black power and I'm still then I'm still involved in those communities but the plants have allowed me to open up myself to new horizons and step out of my comfort zone into new areas and new territories to break bread the manner <laughs> with <laughs> with others from their community and you know make connections like the mycelium does and how it spreads and links up and for me that's what I'm a part of that's what I'm trying to support that initiative you know in building bridges you know bridging the gap you know allowing communities to come together share ideas concepts and I say that simply because there's a lot of research currently done in the psychedelic fields you know around PTSD MDMA mushrooms and all the rest of it being used to help people with, you know, post-traumatic stress, um, stress disorder, people coming back from war, you know, people who've experienced trauma. And again, in my humble opinion, James, nobody has, who's not experienced the African experience of experiencing trauma for over 500 years, not having any support, not having any kind of therapy, then being transplanted to a part of the world where then you're at the bottom of the ladder, you know, econ, you know, there's, there's a lot, there's a lot of baggage that we hold basically that this is the butterfly effect of why I believe the young people are psh, 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 and adults and you know, there's a breakdown in, in, in the black family and other families, poor families in general, yeah. But um, I'm aware of that and I feel that that was deliberately done. You know, there was an intention behind that about separating indigenous people from their culture, from their traditions and then introducing them to something new, which doesn't work for us. Well, yeah, it's, it's yeah, it's like, um the art it's it's the art of war if you can if you could dismantle the family then you can dismantle the culture yeah. uh and and definitely you, you said that you you come from the caribbean yeah like and so and the only reason you're in the caribbean is because you were brought there as slaves is that right that's correct yeah. so Kidnapped, yeah, man. basically so you were you were kidnapped i know there's like a really crazy history at, where like the origination of slavery was actually from certain african tribes selling other african tribes to the white people and then the white guys were like let's just fucking take them all kind of thing uh, yeah, something along those lines but ultimately you were you, your people were kidnapped you were taken to one place you found some level of liberation in that place and now now you live as the first generation of people basically living in the in in the shallows of the land of the people who enslaved your people exactly. so there's like this very strange um there's this very and, and you're finding your liberation inside of that which is which is interesting as well um I don't know where my question is there, but it's, it's just very interesting to, to see it. Like, how, here's the question. Where do you see, um, where do you see inside of, uh, inside of, we'll say the, the consequences of what they call it? Post, post traumatic slave syndrome, I think is, is the one that's coming up now. Like, where do you see the response of that inside of, um, inside of black culture in London? Like, do you see it somewhere in like, do you see it in certain behaviors? I mean, obviously violence and this kind of stuff. But what I'm wondering about is, um, is, is previously when we had a conversation, I believe we talked about um, like the use of cannabis and the use of alcohol mm -hmm. uh, and that being, that being tied into all of that. Yeah, those are pretty much were our vices because, you know, back on the plantations, that's what we were 
you know, being forced to, to work with, you know, um, you know, on the sugar plantations and so forth, that was you being used to produce rum that come from the Caribbean, Jamaica, Barbados and so forth. So we have a, you know, a, a heritage relationship, um, you know, with, with alcohol and marijuana in, in that regards. And um, as I was saying, you know, in conversation, growing up in the community where I'm from, you know, that's pretty much what we've done. I'd always say, you know, on, you know, going to school, you go to school and you do your thing. And if you're sneaking off or at the weekend, me and my friends, we will go and smoke a joint, smoke, you know, have a drink and so forth. And that was culturally, you felt empowered by that, right? Yeah, that you that's, the, you know, that's what we do, do you know, growing up, you're seeing your uncles, your grandfathers, you know, playing dominoes with a joint with some rum. That's what, you know, that's what we do. That's how we do it, you know, that's, you know, there's no, I don't see anything else going on. I don't see my, I don't see that in, around my table, you know, I don't see that around my table. So all of this was just like, that's what we do. And all of that is bad. So anybody who, of my friends that might say, yeah, we're going glue sniffing. I'll be like, no, <laughs> that's not, that's, I'm not interested in that. One, because I'm not interested in that, but culturally it wasn't acceptable. So those vices were acceptable. And um, obviously we know, you know, the pros and cons of, you know, alcohol and, <laughs> um, and, and weed in general uh, or marijuana. And, um, but I'm saying that to say that growing up, seeing the, you know, I went to a pretty diverse, you know, secondary school or high school, as you refer to it. And, um, you know, the guys there, the white guys that I went to school with, who were me and them were cool. They were, you know, every weekend, it was like, yeah, man, we was up the Hampstead Heath, down and popped a few pills, done some mushrooms. The aliens came out of the sky, <laughs> you know? <laughs> the UFOs, were right? I'm like, fuck, I'm like, these guys are crazy, man. They're just junkies. And, you know, I, feel, I felt really bad for them, to tell the truth. I felt, you know, I, I, I felt, yeah, I pitied them to some degree in my lack of my naivety of understanding what these things were. But in all honesty, I don't think, and I know that I've not been introduced to these plants in the same way that they were using them at the time. Sure. So there was recreational, having a fun Friday, just do as much as we can to lose ourselves. That's not how I was introduced to these plants. So I'm saying that to say pretty much the weed and alcohol was introduced to me in the same way in an abusive way I've got I had an abusive relationship with alcohol I had an abusive relationship with marijuana I didn't appreciate or respect them for what they are so in even in alcohol we call it spirit the alcohol spirit because they say it connects you with the spirit you know the ether in the alcohol is the ether of the spirit that you can communicate or allow you to have altered states of consciousness to communicate with your ancestors if done in the right set, set and setting the same with marijuana the same with pretty much it. coffee you know you could you know in the right set and setting with the right intention these were tools these plants were not just in a, used in a recreational way that we've, we use them today. So in my community, these things have been abused. Yeah. And then the healing modalities that I could introduce, I consider a taboo, a taboo. Right. So if I was, you know, so we're a catch-22 of fucking, yeah, you know, how, 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 how are we able to move forward? How are we able to progress? How are we able to heal ourselves? Because the things that potentially could, we see as, nah, that's that white hippie stuff and sure, sure. You know, all the rest of it. And the things that we feel comfortable with, you know, are detriment to our, to our community. So outside of, you know, the, you know, um, the, the violence that's happening in, in our community. And even because it's only a small, in all honesty, it's the media that is really blowing a lot of that out of proportion in a sense where it's always been happening. Sure. You know, but there's the young people have more access to tools, you know, f more aggressive, violent tools that bring bring it to your attention, you know, and the media's highlight and focus on it is different, as well as the fact that um, everybody and their mama's got a, uh, a camera, a camcorder, so you can film everything and everything is being documented and showcased where that wasn't always the case. Well, that, that, that's, that's present at this point, like all over the world, right, because um yeah, yeah, it's fine, we'll just keep going, yeah. Uh, that, you know, violent crime is down all over the world and yet um, reporting on violent crime is up like hundreds and hundreds of percent, right? So mm -hmm. there's definitely a manip like when I said, this is the stereotype, yeah. I'm like, I know this is a stereotype, but it, it's the one that I've been, that I've been given, right? Sure. So, so some of, and I'm saying that to say that there's just a very small pocket, a very small community that are committing crime, violence, and all the rest of it. But as a whole, we have a lack of, you know, communication, just the way that mothers are, have, to, you know, the relationship with mothers and daughters, fathers and sons, and the lack of us being able to communicate on a level and be honest, speaking from the heart, the way we communicate, not just black people, but just this new young generation. I, as you know, I work with them. So I see the way they communicate with each other. It's just aggressive. It's just, there's no, there's no room for, there's no room for love. There's no room to be soft, man. As I said, you've got, you've got to have another layer on to be out here, man. You can't, or you're, or you're, or you're going to, you know, you're going to be, you're going to feel it otherwise. So um, everybody's got to have that, mm, that tough, and, you know, after having my experiences, being one of those guys who've, you know, got to put on the mask and play the role while you're out here and just being able to 
relax and take the layers off and be me and be free and not have to worry and think about that. I've seen that happen in my community without even the young people experiencing it yet. I've seen that by bringing them to places like this, taking them out of the city, the concrete jungle and bringing them in and around nature where they lose that layer, where they come out and they say, wow, look at the bird. Look at the monk jack, you see me earlier on? You know, like, look, because we don't see that stuff where we're from. And he's like, it brings out the innocence again. And that's where I'm coming from with it, where I think these tools can play a part and it can help in multiple ways. And I just hope and I think, like to think that I could inspire those who are qualified and got the credentials to be able to push these things forward in a way that's respectful and considered in, you know, in, in addressing this. Because yes, there is something called post-traumatic slave syndrome that has never been addressed. And again, when people bring it up, it's just not, respected in, in in a way that I feel it should be if you just really take the time out to check out what has happened you know because most people don't know what's happened they know the in principle you was there you got brought there and the whips chains you know this that and the other but the psychological trauma what the impact of that you know over 500 years as we've spoken about if there's a mother who might have been physically abused by a father we already, you know, I've done, I'm doing a study and a research about epigenetics and how that's part, of, that could just be one generation's worth of trauma that's passed on to the next, and that's a big thing. It, it, can, it can have a large impact. And we're saying, well, what if daughter, mother, grandmother, great grandmother, great, great grandmother, and they've been seen extreme elements, you know, everything from seeing their husband's penises cut off, you know, seeing women being hung from a tree and their stomachs being cut like open. eaten alive by dogs. Yeah, it's like, come on, man. So I'm just saying, and then, you know, it's not even somebody putting their arm around you and saying, you're all right. Like, we haven't even had that, not to say that I would sort of deal the issue, but there's been no kind of support. It's like, come on, you're free now, get on and get on with it. And then you would wonder why our environments are dysfunctional. Like, for me, it's pretty obvious. And then there's some of us that come out, step out, attempt to you know, start some kind of healing or work in our community. And you go back to, especially in America, you go back to, you know, the times when they are, you know, allowing the slaves to be free and, you know, their freedom. And then when they do set up shop for that, you know, that shit gets burned down. That shit is like, you know, we don't really want you to, you know, places like Black Wall Street and stuff, you know, historical places or centers in America that, you know, were really trying to thrive and become something once they were given the license to be free and develop. It's like, no, we don't like the progress that's being made. So we're shutting that down and they burnt down the whole, you know, the whole city, the whole town. Right. So this is, again, more trauma, more trauma, more trauma. And then you've got me, my generation, we come out and I'm just trying to get a job. I'm just trying to do the right thing now and I can't get the job. I, you know, there's more blockages. So I'm saying going back 500 years from my great, 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 you know, grandparents and family seeing that, that being passed on to me. And then you've got the frustrations of the young generation. And as I said, they wonder where it's coming from. For me, it's pretty obvious where it's coming from. Yeah. And if this can help, the people coming back from war, the people that you sent to war. You and know, by this, you mean like, 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 a, a, like cultural, cultural um, ways of living mm. around work with psychedelic plants yes. as, as, a part of, as a part of culture and a part of growing up. Most definitely, most definitely. So as I said, I work with these young people. We've developed, I work with other groups and organizations in the capital that work with young people developing, especially young black males developing the rights of passage programs. And they, they, do, they do amazing work in our community. But um, again, I just say like, if we take a step back and we see what prevented our young boys, because basically you have warriors, you have, you know, violent physical people in all communities. And that's cool. Yeah. If when they raise them, you're like, do you know what? You're gonna be the security guards. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? we We've need got, you. Yeah, yeah. We have a job for you, you know? But now you've got these giants, you know, you've got these young, uh, and there's nothing for them to do. Right. You know, and back in the days you say, yeah, we'll join the army, you know, and go and kill innocent people. Yeah. And that's not, you know, or people that have done, not done anything to you. And that's not the way forward. So um, it's like, what, what options, what alternatives can we give these people? All these people that need it, not just, the young black males or black people, I'm saying, because I said, we go around, people suffering from depression, anxiety, and all the rest of it, and it's all butterfly effects of some trauma that they've experienced, or someone before them has experienced, and it's not being dealt with. And as you know, you take these tools, you take the mushrooms, and they bring it to the forefront, they support you and help you in dealing with that. It can be, and it is very challenging, and I've got to places where I've realized, look, I can't do this by myself, man. I need more of us having these experiences. Share, I need to share the load, basically, yeah. with my community so we can then go out and be proactive because I'm pretty much one, if not the only person in my community in London, coming out and saying this stuff as far as this is one of the solutions. We could look at using mushrooms, MDMA, boga, you name it, in healing our community. Hmm. Uh, it's starting to rain a little bit. Um, the video feed is done. Okay. Uh, we're at about an hour. Okay. Before I get the, the, the much desired but also obligatory social media handles, um, from your experience 
and I want to focus back in on mushrooms because you know we're we're on the same page <laughs> here. Like a lot of a lot of a lot of love uh, for the fungi. Um, what do you see as the qualities that it has brought out in you? Um, what of those qualities are the ones that directly address the the troubles that you see inside? Well, and, and of course, all over the world, but specifically inside of, of your communities here in London, what qualities does the mushrooms bring up in you that you feel directly address the problems? Okay, so um, I won't go into too much details as far as what I experienced, but in principle, one of the things that the mushrooms allowed me to do was drop my load. I carried a lot of baggage. There's a lot of baggage, although out in the world, people are like, Darren's cool, he's a happy guy, and you know, this, that, and the other. I've got a lot of baggage, you know, personal baggage, family baggage, you know, and historical baggage. And it allowed me to drop my load and lighten my load, and that was a relief. And a relief in regards to me thinking that I can't leave that load, that this load is so important, I need to be holding on to it. But it allowed me to let it go and freed me up. And that in itself was one of the biggest blessings that I had. And that freeing up allowed me to start to live life. Mm. And I always use, so I don't go into my story too much, but I always use the movie. One of my favorite films is Big Fish. Yeah. I always talk about Big Fish, man. And just that, you know, the removing of the fear of death, so to speak. So that was one of the things it allowed me to do. You know, I had a few challenging experiences and it led me to remove, not completely and in its entirety, but address, deal with and appreciate death for what, for what it is. And that movie Big Fish is in, in the same way where, you know, he looks in the woman's eye, he finds out how he dies. So therefore, all of these encounters that he's having, all these challenges he faces, he's like, this isn't how I die. Let me do this to the fullest, you know, let me experience this. You know, 10 guys surround him and want to beat him up. And he's like, this isn't how I die. Come on, let's do this, you know? <laughs> you know, that's what it gave me a new lease of life, James, you know, and you know, and at minimum, that's what I would like people to experience at minimum, let alone all the other potential healing modalities, as well as the potential of where it's continuing to push us. And you know, this fungi, this, as you know, my elders, Kalinda, I've got to give Kalinda a shout out, you know, this organic technology that we're, we're working with, just what its agenda is and us becoming what we are still yet to become, you know, and there's the, there's the grand thing, the mystery side of it too. And I think that is part and parcel of it. But as me and you discuss, and I'm aware Kalinde's teachings and some others might be too far, far for people because they're just dealing with, they're on the ground and they just need survival day to day. So that's where I come in to some degree. And it's like, okay, let's break the bread, <laughs> share the manna, you know, for those, you know, and that's not literally, but you know, metaphorically <laughs> to the community. That's the knowledge and information. Let's make this subject less a taboo. So people can just start talking about it at least because you bring up the subject of magic mushrooms, you bring up the subject of psychedelics, and people are like, nah. So that's, that's, that's the first barrier that I've got, got, that I've got to break down. So that's what I'm trying to do. That's what I think it, how it could benefit the community and on its first level. And then people dropping their load, whatever their load is, and then allow to discover themselves, reevaluate themselves. That's, you know, those were the first levels of experiences that I had through the mushrooms. And I'm forever indebted to them for allowing me to have that space because there was a lot going on here, you know, and you, you blame people. Ultimately, you blame yourself, you're the, you know, and that's what it, it was always reminding me, like, you're not to blame. You know, you're not to blame. And it's like, you're being too bloody hard on yourself, man. Relax, put that over there. See what it's like over here without all of that baggage. It's like, it feels good. It's like, do you want more of that? I'm like, yeah, we'll leave that there. Don't ignore it, don't abandon it. You know, you, you delve into it when you need to and learn how to deal with it better. And that's what it allowed me to do. Just deal with it. It's not gone anywhere. It's still there, but I'm just learning how to deal with it better. Right, and it's I like learning how to be responsible without blame. There you go. And if I could extend that to a wider community, you know, the butterfly effect, I think, would be tremendous, you know. And if there's more, I just need to talk. As I said, the spores told me to keep sporing, <laughs> you know, get it out there, broadcast, broadcast, you know. And as I say, if the seeds germinate this season or the spores and we get, you know, it fruits, great. But if it's next season, it may or may not. And it might be 10, 5, you know, 5, 10 years down the line. All I need to do, I'll keep, I'm an, that ambassador to just keep putting that out there. And all I see myself as in some cases in my community, you know, I'm the guinea pig. They're waiting all. Darren's been doing this for like seven, eight years now. Hasn't gone mad, <laughs> hasn't died, you know. <laughs> da -da 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 -da, you know, they've done their checklist. Maybe we can give it a go. And that's kind of what I've, you know, put myself up to be. I'm, I'm willing to be, I am that person. And I'm not doing it for them, I'm doing it for myself. It was a per personal, selfish journey, but I've realized the butterfly effect and benefits that it have, you know, for the wider community. So that's, that's where I come with it. Yeah, man. excellent. 
Uh, to finish us off, why don't you let the listeners know where they can find out more about what you do and, uh, and follow your work more in depth. Great, man. So I'm, I'm a real humble social media guy. I'm just a Facebook guy. And you can catch me on Facebook. I go under the name of Darren LeBaron. That's Darren, D-A-R-R-E-N-L-E for Lee. Well, my middle name is Leon. And Baron, the name that I was um, adopted or initiated into. Um, and I'm also in, under, in, on Instagram under Darren LeBaron too. Email wise, you can find me at Darren at ancientfuture.org.uk. And um, yeah, and I'm very keen for people who understand my journey as far as mythology, trying to get all these mushroom connections around Africa and stuff. If you find stuff from your region that connects, I'm, I'm, I'm into all of that stuff. So please bombard me with emails and suggestions of things that I should be checking out and looking at too. And uh, yeah, I'm willing to build. And I also do like mushroom cultivation workshops and stuff like that. So if you catch me on Facebook, you see what I'm doing. I'm trying to travel the world and teach people how to grow their own man and fish for themselves. Cool. Well, uh... Thank you very much for that. Okay. I'll be sure to add all those things in the show notes to this episode, which listeners know is at jamswgesso.com. Uh, and you know what, for, for what it's worth, Darren, um, excellent work. Thank you for doing what you're doing, man. Oh, man, I appreciate you, James, too, man, for your work, too. And I must say that you've been a big inspiration, too. And I must say on that, because I'm here in the flesh with you now. You know, as I said, I observed you. I met you for the first time physically in Azora those few years. And I do my Googles, man, whoever I'm meeting, whoever I check out, and I see the work that you're doing. And as a solo guy, you know, I don't see you with a big team. You're not coming, with, you know, with a team. You're doing great work, amazing work. You know, the podcasts, the books. And it's an inspiration to me to have quit my job, my day job, and take the calls and follow you in arms, you know, to do the work. And that's what I'm here to do too, man. So I appreciate your efforts. You've been an inspiration, man. All right. Thanks, Darren. I appreciate that, man. And cut. Well, I hope you appreciated this conversation with Darren Springer. I certainly learned a lot in that conversation, so I hope that you did as well. Uh, if you liked what you heard, definitely go follow Darren on Facebook, Darren LeBaron. Uh, links to that are contained in the show notes to this episode at jameswjesso.com. Just search 91, uh, which is the name, the number of this episode in the search bar at jamesbjesso.com or it'll just be right on the front page if you you know check this soon enough after its release this podcast was brought to you by a wonderful set of people um, who donate to its uh donate to its existence <laughs> you know with with money so if you would like to be one of those people who help support this podcast existing inside of the economic reality of the western world you can do so be by becoming my patron on Patreon or by leaving a one-time PayPal or crypto donation. Links to uh, how to, links to do that are contained um, in the show notes to this episode, in the description on YouTube, or you could just go to jameswbjesso.com forward slash support to see all those options listed there, which include other options like buying copies of my books or um, art or t-shirts or, you know, whatever. Thank you very much for listening to this episode, and I will see you on March 1st in 2019, which will uh, be when this podcast relaunches after a two-episode break to focus on a secret project that only patrons are aware of, and a couple projects uh, that aren't so secret, but I'm not going to mention them because we're kind of running out of time. But if you follow me on YouTube, you'll know about it. So anyways, thank you, and I will see you on the next episode of Adventures Through the Mind. Take care. Something else I'd just like to quickly include about uh, about that talk, because I feel like it's it's valuable, is that the reason I was there was to talk at a launch of a new menu for a chain of restaurants in England. Uh, and it's sort of a strange place to be, but the launch was a new vegan menu. And although, you know, like my my personal sort of thoughts around veganism for myself as a dietary option aside, um, the reason that veganism was being introduced to this menu, taking up something like 40% of, of the menu of this major, of this like popular food chain franchise, excuse me, um, is because the owner of the restaurant went down to the jungle, drank ayahuasca, and had this revelation that he needed to do something, um, whatever was in his power, to help address the ecological crisis the planet is facing. And what he saw was encouraging or making it easier for people to eat less meat. Um, not like everyone needs to go vegan, but hey, I need to make it accessible for people who eat meat 
to not eat meat sometimes. And, um, and he did so by making a delicious vegan menu. And despite the fact that um, it's quite culturally taboo um, and a very divisive and charged topic, he chose to bring me in from Canada because he felt like I would be able to appropriately represent um, the power and potential and um, of, of these of these plants of psychedelic plants in a mature context um, and was apparently quite a quite a risky decision for him to make because most of the people there were not really they're not really already informed as to why this is a good thing and it's it's you know it's quite stigmatized in England still so I just wanted to include that because I really respect what he chose to do. His name's William, and uh, the restaurant is called the Banana Tree, and it's in London. And uh, this is not like this is not paid advertising for any way. It's just really, you know, I really respect William, and I really respect what he chose to do, and I really appreciate the opportunity he offered me, and you know, the larger psychedelic culture in a way by doing what he did. And so, just want to give him a big shout out and let you know if you're in London to go check out the Banana Tree and try out their new vegan menu because it's it's pretty tasty.